Hey folks, this is Mark with Eigen Designs and welcome back to my channel. Today in the shop, I'm going to be building a solid walnut bookshelf made from some wood that I found here locally that's got a really cool story behind it. I got a lot of stuff to cover today, but if you want more detailed information, I'll have links to plans down in the description below. All right, let's go. This past week, I connected with a really nice family through a woodworking social media group that we have here in Texas. It was a family that was selling their father's lumber who had passed away in 2016, but they were only just now ready to get rid of it. And they weren't looking to make a ton of money off the wood, but rather trying to find a woodworker that would have the wood serve its intended purpose to make furniture and other things for their family. So I picked up about 2000 board foot of black walnut and some cherry and there's so much that I had to put additional lumber racks in the shop just to hold it all. And my wife and I are jokingly calling my shop the boardroom because there's so much stuff here. But it's just a good lesson out there for any woodworker out there. Make sure you're involved in your local social media outlets for your area because deals like this are going to come up for lumber and tools and you certainly don't want to miss out on a good opportunity. So today we're going to be putting some of that black walnut to use by making the bookshelf. Now I'm going to start off by cutting the boards down to more manageable lengths using my crosscut sled. And I'm going to be kind of quick going from step to step because there's a lot of stuff to cover today. But if you're looking for more detailed information about dimensions and other things like that, then you can find the links to the plans in the description below. I take the additional step of using some painter's tape to label each individual board. Not only because all the boards are roughly the same dimension at this point, but more specifically, there's certain pieces that were picked for the grain pattern that would be more prominent based on the design of the bookshelf. So I want to make sure that those don't get lost as I go through the milling process. After verifying that my jointer fence was completely square, I then go ahead and face joint and edge joint each of the boards that I just rough cut to length. The boards that you see on the left are too wide to go through my jointer, so we're going to address those in a second. But the narrower boards that did go through the jointer are now ready to be thickness planed. And I often use pencil marks as indicators for when each board has had every bit of the surface thickness planed. Now if you're someone that doesn't have a jointer or doesn't even have a planer, you can either buy lumber that's already been surfaced, or if you buy it at a hardwood dealer, they'll often do some of this millwork for you so you don't have to rely on your own equipment. As these first few boards are coming out of the planer, I got my first look at just how beautiful the grain of this walnut was. Whenever it was rough sawn and had been laying out for seven years, it was hard to get a good look at it. But now that I do, it's just really pretty. So now it's time to focus on the wider boards that did not fit through my jointer. It is possible to joint a board like this using your planer by using a flat slab on the bottom as your reference surface and then using a set of shims and hot glue to hold it in place. By shimming it and preventing any lateral movement side to side, you have a flat reference surface on the bottom. In this case, I'm using three quarter inch MDF. The planer can actually create a flat surface on top. Once that's done, you can then flip it over and use that new flat surface as a reference point and run the board through the planer like normal without the sled. This is a way that you can actually get a board that's wider than your jointer to actually be S4S. After making a few shallow passes through the thickness planer, you can see that there's actually been a flat surface created with this sled that you can then use as a reference and run it through the jointer like normal. This is also the first time I'm getting a look at the grain pattern of this particular walnut board, and this is why I chose it to be the top part of the bookshelf because it's so pretty. I'm going to fast forward through me planing the other side of this board and skip straight ahead to the glue up. So I had to glue another strip of walnut to the side of this particular board so that it was wide enough to serve as the top part of the bookshelf. Once the glue was dry, I then ran it through the drum sander 
using a few shallow passes to get rid of that top layer of glue. And then I cut it to final dimension on my table saw. Now I was feeling extra adventurous for some reason, and I decided to take this one little indention on the edge of the board and accentuate that by replicating a live edge using a cut saw shaping disc. These are attachments that you can put on the end of your angle grinder, and they're surprisingly easy to use. They don't give you a lot of chatter like you might expect, and they allow you to shape the wood in whatever shape you want it to be. In this case, I'm trying to simulate a live edge, and I use the natural sap wood of the walnut board to kind of guide how I shape the edge of the wood, and it turned out really good. Of course, it does leave some pretty deep gouge marks, so I had to come back with a sander and get out all those gouge marks and try to smooth it over the best I could. Next, I turn my attention to the four posts that are going to be on each of the corners of the bookshelf. For this, I'll be using some eight quarter walnut, and I'm going to cut these about an eighth of an inch larger than what I need them so that I can get them down a final dimension using the thickness planer. That way I know that all sides will be square. To make these legs a little bit more interesting, I'm going to be cutting a taper on two of the four sides for each of the legs. I get out my square and my pencil to make two marks on the leg and then strike a line between the marks to replicate the angle that I'm looking for. Once I had that angle, I then took a scrap piece of plywood and some other cutoffs and I used some CA glue to make a quick jig where I could replicate this angled cut for all the four different legs. Now, as I was running the sled through the table saw, my fingers were about an inch and a half away from the blade. I was extremely aware of my hand positioning as I was making the cut, but I elected not to take the time to engineer out the solution by creating a mechanical clamp that wasn't my fingers. But if you're going to do this, don't be like me. Take the time to actually build it right and don't put your fingers that close to the blade. After cutting all four posts to length, I then take the back two posts and cut a half inch rabbit. And this half inch rabbit is where the back panel is eventually going to sit on the back of the bookshelf. Now you can swap out your dado stack if you want to. I just decided to take a couple of passes with my table saw blade because it was so quick. Uh, either way is fine. You just gotta be left with something that looks like this. The last thing we need to prepare are the three shelves that are going to go inside the bookshelf. I've skipped a few steps and I've already done the glue up. Once those are dry, I ran them through the jointer just to remove that top layer of glue, make sure everything is nice and thickness plane, and then I go over to my crosscut sled and cut them to final dimension. Once the shelves were cut to final dimension, I then made some marks on the back part of the shelves where we have to notch out for the post that's going to be in the back corner. You can see it right here. Once I made the marks, I then went over to my bandsaw to cut out the notch, although you could do this with your table saw if you don't have a bandsaw. With all of our pieces created, we can now focus on creating the joinery to get everything to fit together. I start off by putting the side panel in the middle of the post and striking a line. Now to actually create this joinery, I'm going to be using Festool's Domino. Realizing that a lot of folks out there don't have a domino, you can create this exact same effect with the self-centering jig and a dowel. But because I've got the domino, I'm going to go ahead and use it today. I go ahead and cut mortises on all the lines that I've struck on the post. And then I do the same thing on the side panel.
Once all the mortises are cut, I do a quick dry fit just to make sure everything lines up perfectly. Once I know everything dry fits together perfectly, I go ahead and focus on the mortises to be cut for the shelving. We don't want to glue anything up yet because we want to make sure those mortises fit perfectly as well before we glue anything up and make it permanent. I strike three evenly spaced lines that are going to represent the height of the shelving once everything is done. And then I go back through and mark out in two inch increments where the dominoes need to be placed. There's going to be four dominoes for each of the shelves making sure you don't cut through the side panel whenever you're cutting your mortise. In my case, I'm going to use the dominoes that are supposed to be 30 millimeters long. In actuality, they're more like 28. But I can't cut the mortise half and half between the two different pieces. So I'm going to have a shallower mortise in the side panel and then a deeper mortise on the actual shelving to be able to use these particular dominoes. Hopefully that makes sense to the people listening. I hope no one out there tries to replicate this and accidentally cuts all the way through their side panel because that's going to ruin your day. So pay attention to how deep you're cutting your mortises and that you can actually house the tenon whenever you take the depth of the mortise and the side panel and the shelf into account. Once all the mortises were cut, I put in some dominoes and then did a quick dry fit with the shelf just to make sure everything was fitting perfectly. There's a handful of things I'm gonna do prior to glue up because it's easier to do them now as opposed to once everything is fully assembled. First is I apply an eighth inch round over to the legs and each of the external faces of the shelves just to make sure that they have a nice soft corner. And after I get done routing, I usually take a small piece of 220 sandpaper and just hand sand over the edge to make sure that you don't have any more rough spots on the edge, which can sometimes be left behind by router bits. I also take this opportunity to sand each one of the components that I have prior to assembly because you can get to all the edges relatively quickly with a random orbital sander. The last thing I do is take some black star bond with some activator and quickly fill in any of the holes that I have in the wood. Thankfully, these are not deep enough to where it would require epoxy because epoxy generally takes a couple of days to cure. This is a really quick method to patch any shallow holes that you might have and quickly sand them flush before final assembly. Okay, now it's time for the glue up and today we're gonna to be using Titebond 2's dark wood glue. This has the same properties as normal Titebond 2, but the glue itself has a darker pigment and the residue that's left behind has a almost a brownish color as opposed to the yellow color, which makes the seams much harder to see whenever you're working with something like walnut. For this particular glue up, I decided to glue the two side panels together first and let it cure overnight so that I had two rigid pieces before trying to glue up the uh, shelves in between the two side pieces. So I had these in the parallel clamps overnight before revisiting the rest of the glue up the next day. You know, this is only my third time using a domino for a project like this. I've only had it about four months or so but there's something oddly satisfying about seeing a project come together like this. And as you're doing the glue up, all the different pieces just fitting in perfectly and aligning properly, it's really satisfying to watch that come together. Once everything was assembled, I used some extended parallel clamps to apply pressure at each one of the shelves until the glue had a chance to dry. I'll be attaching the top of the bookshelf using these figure eights and I'll be recessing one on each of the four posts to where they sit flush with the top of the post and these are going to be facing inward so they won't be easily visible. Here 
Each of these figure eights are secured to the post using a wood screw that I had pre-drilled for off camera. To complete the installation, I turned the entire bookshelf upside down to help me center everything within the tabletop and then again pre-drill some holes and attach the wood screws to hold it in place. The finish I'll be using today is Rubio Monocoat's Walnut Color, which accentuates some of the darker features in the wood, which I personally like. For horizontal surfaces, it's easy enough to trowel it on, and for vertical surfaces, you can take a sponge or even a rag and just wipe it on, making sure to wipe it off with a dry, clean towel at the end. While I'm waiting for this finish to dry, I then turn my attention to the last step in this process, which is to create the back panel. Now there is plywood out there that has a walnut veneer that you can buy, but I don't have any money left since I bought all the other wood from that family. So instead I take some of the um, Baltic birch plywood that I had left over from another project and then apply two coats of a darker stain that closely match the finished color of the bookshelf that I just built. The back panel just sits in that rabbit that we cut on the back posts earlier and I secure it in place with some 18 gauge brad nails. I couldn't be happier with how this bookshelf turned out. The four posts in the corners give the bookshelf a little bit of dimension, but the design in itself is quite simple, which allows you to focus on the beauty of the wood, which was the original intention behind this project. I had a lot of fun making this and I hope you enjoyed this as well. If you like this type of content, please hit that like button because that's a free way to help support my channel and consider subscribing because I have a lot more content like this coming out. Okay, I'll see you on the next one.